you know, maybe it'll, it'll explode. Yeah, there's, uh, I think there are opportunities. I think the other, the, sort of the, I, I like your response to my question, but my, my thinking is also that, you know, the social media created an environment where big brands with a lot of stake could, felt like they could wade into this without a lot of risk. And that was an important reason why sort of the silver protests were able to happen at the scale that they were. True, I, I think that's accurate, but they joined in late. So the yeah. main organizers were grassroots, yeah. and then it was sort of like, oh, well, let's just do this right now. It was sort of the, the snowball effect. I mean, it was easy for people to join at that point. Yes? Can you give a comment on that? Also, a little worse today, so be a little quiet. But at the, so when the protests happened, I was on the board of Wikimedia, and we actually spent a lot of time thinking about like what could we do with because, because it's not what we're about, right? We're not an advocacy organization. Uh, so if we were going to do something that was like massively disruptive to what we usually do, like it was, a, it was a very strategic decision. We spent a very long time consulting with a lot of people. Like when can we do something that would have the most impact? Like for the NSA stuff, it's just ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. It, you know, we have one shot at a blackout, right? But it's not going to be effective uh, very much longer. Like, like, that was just such a, what we saw with the blackout was just the opportunity to jump in and like add to this wave that would finally tip it over and then, and that's, it's kind of hard to get a large disorganized, decentralized community to agree like, yes, this is the point to jump in on the wave and we haven't been able to get that, the, and on that scale for any other issues really. Yeah, the point for this, the NSA issue hasn't happened yet. Okay. It's going to happen. But it, it, well, it could. Could happen. And just one more comment on the Wikipedia model, and thank you for coming, by the way. Um, you know, Wikipedia is, I think, the the response to the so-called, you know, Silicon Valley versus Hollywood meme or explanation of all of what happened. Because Wikipedia, as I said, doesn't fit that fight. They're not Silicon Valley. They are a community of you know, thousands of people who write for this encyclopedia online and volunteer their time. And, you know, that, so, you know, for anybody, some, I, I've had other uh, talks and there were some skeptics who think that, oh, this is just Google. Google is the one that did this. It was Google versus Hollywood. Well, that's not true. I mean, you know, that's discounting Wikipedia's huge involvement. And then, you know, there were so many other people doing, you know, their own thing and adding to the protest, too, that I think, to go back to the lesson of the Paul Revere story is that you know you have to look at all of the members of the communities that got involved, and even though we like to pick our own heroes, uh, I think my message is that there were so many heroes I can't even capture all of them in my book, uh, but I tried to you know identify you know many or some of the key players at least in my view. Yes, me. What do you think is, um, so in this case, you know, there was a perceived danger, and now we never know whether it would have happened or not. That's the information altogether. And the community reacted against it. Do you think, uh, what do you think of the, of the role of the community as, uh, as a proactive uh, force uh, to prevent something like this, or to, or to create an environment where something like this would never happen. Uh, like, I mean, there's a budding movement for copyright reform going on. Exactly. Uh, that uh, CC has now finally uh, decided to back. Uh, and uh, we don't know where it's going to go. Uh, but uh, do you think the, the community could come together with a similar kind of uh, organization? Entirely. Entirely. Huh? Entirely. I think so. I mean, if you look at the history of the freedom of the press, the fight over you know, freedom related to the printing press, it took hundreds of years. So hopefully it doesn't take that long with the freedom of the internet. But uh, eventually it went out. And now the freedom of the press is recognized in nearly every constitution in the world. And I think what might happen in this you know, fight is that it's certainly an international fight. And what we might see is a country like Brazil or a country like Poland being the first one to codify a certain set of rights protecting internet freedoms, whether it be statutory or constitutional. And then eventually, I think that's going to spread because of the way that trade 
happens. So our, you know, our major trading partners, if it turns out, for instance, let's say Brazil is a, one of the fast growing developing countries out there, Brazil recognizes that maybe that influences other countries in South America. And then European Union eventually recognizes it too. The United States is going to be hard pressed not to adopt something similar. And yet we have something like the TPP happening right now. Which is the counter force. But it's, that, it's the counter story being told. The propagation of higher IP enforcement through trade bills, trade agreements. The converse, I think, may be one day, is that the propagation of protections for internet freedoms through trade bills as well, trade bills or other agreements as well. As soon as one recognizes it, that's when I think all bets are off. And you know, the, to mention another thing, I mean, Brazil is actually considered an internet bill of rights, and there are other countries too. Uh, no one yet has uh, passed it, at least to my knowledge. But this is all percolating, and it's international. And I think we're less likely to see it in the United States first, at least in my view, given the way that the political economy of our IP debates occurs in the Congress. Yes, back there. Um, I had a question about some of the new groups like Fight for the Future and Internet Defense League, because I think they did it, I mean, they were very successful at doing organizing, um, maybe in new ways. Um, but I think there's potentially a danger in that it becomes almost too easy, or some of the messages get really watered down, yes. in that we don't actually understand what we're fighting against. Um, because, I mean, you might call it online advocacy, but you know, we've just become really good at public relations, too. So I was wondering how you kind of see that going ahead, and how to maybe mitigate that. Um, and then also, I think another criticism of, of some of these groups is, you know, who decides what when the bat the uh, cat signal goes up? You know, it's like these groups are not necessarily representative of the internet as a whole. You know, there are people that are running them. They have certain, you know, agendas. Agendas, I guess. So. In certain particular views. I mean, I, I guess. And, I would... and, and, and before you answer that question, which is a great question, uh, it's it sort of. I was actually going to ask something similar like that. What would it? Do you think it was there was something frivolous about the fact that Kim Kardashian and uh, Justin Bieber thought that that was an important enough thing, but they haven't thought, say, trans-Pacific partnership is important enough to talk about or something like that? But anyway, answer his question because that was bubbling inside me, and I was thinking of asking that, but Tim asked it more eloquently about you know, a great bigger thing. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important for the whole theory of popular constitutionalism as well. If we really believe the people are the final deciders of the meaning of individual freedoms and the Constitution, then it's sort of a question of, well, you know, at what level, do, what happens if it turns out if you know, certain segments of the population don't know much about the debate, but then there are maybe a minority is well informed, how do we sort of bridge the divide and whose view should prevail? It's a really difficult question for that theory and I don't have a sort of an easy answer. But as far as the specifics in the SOPA debate, you know, I, I think Fight for the Future was very meticulous about making sure what they said was correct. So there's a video they prepared that was four minutes long that analyzed the SOPA bill and why it was, in their view, so bad. And they had some help from uh, EFF lawyers, and uh, or they at least read the analysis, legal analysis of EFF lawyers as well as CDT lawyers to make sure that what they were saying was accurate. Uh, so in addition to the kind of memes, internet memes that they created, Free Bieber, uh, they also provided information through this video and as well as on their website. So the Free Bieber website also had sort of factual information about the bill and also what they believed it would do. And it had statements from some attorneys sort of supporting them. So Jonathan Zittrain, for instance, from Harvard Law School sort of agreed with their interpretation of what the Bieber component of the bill you know, might do. So I think in part, you know, you're right to be concerned, well, is it just 
you know, lacking in substance in terms of the analysis, but at least for a fight for the future of the group, I think they were really meticulous and they wanted to be sure because they, didn't, they wanted to answer that kind of criticism that, you know, look, you know, this is just not right, you know, not accurate portrayal of SOFA. So they wanted to have the support. And then when Harvard professor Lawrence Try said there was a First Amendment violation likely created by SOFA, the Fight for the Future group told me they felt so vindicated because they had been pressing for this notion of censorship as the response, whereas some other more traditional uh, internet nonprofits were reluctant to use that term as somehow sort of clouding the debate and being too, too uh, hyperbolic, basically. So at least for the fight for the future's participation, you know, they try to make sure that uh, they were grounded in you know, legal analysis. But I think you know, it, it still remains. You can never avoid the possibility that some people involved in the debate will not be very informed. But I think that's what we have to accept in our democracy. And if we really believe in this notion of popular constitutionalism, we have to accept that there may be people who are not as informed. Now, I think it is, in part, responsibility of Congress to educate the people. And if Congress does not do an adequate job in, in saying, well, if you believe people are misinformed, you explain the bill to people in a way that they're going to be on board. And that's a part of democracy versus just thinking, oh, they're misinformed and they don't know anything, you know, kind of idea. And let, let us do our job and let, let us pass this bill. Now, I mean, at least in my vision of democracy, that's not the way that ideally it should work. Other questions? Yes. So you know, going back to this, we the people business, um, let's say we do a 80-20 split. Uh, I think I'm being quite generous here, but let's say 20% of the population lives in this world where we understand some of the, the reasonings behind uh, copyright and reform and so on. But then you have the 80% of the population, sort of related to what you were saying, you step out of this building, go into the mall, you run into all these people, and they're just unaware, don't care, you know, the issues of privacy and all those things are simply not something that touches their lives. Now, is that because of indifference, or is that because it's just too damn difficult to understand how these things affect their lives? It may be a little bit of both, but the, the one part that I'll dispute in terms of the framing of the question is that I believe a vast number of people get this notion of internet freedom because so many people are on the internet. And I think that's what this notion of being born with an open, decentralized internet, uh, that, that point that I was trying to make earlier, and that's why I think the popular constitutional theory better explains what was going on. You maybe think that they're misinformed, but it's the way that people are thinking about their relationship to the internet. And if we go back in time in history to the relationship people had with the printing press, it's pretty analogous in terms of the relationship. Uh, the, the printing press, unfortunately, was subject to a lot of government control under the British Crown for uh, over a hundred years. So the government was able actually to clamp down on the press in part in response to piracy, in part in response to heresy, sort of religious texts being printed on the printing press or published on the printing press. So I think if we look back in time and think about, well, how did we get the freedom of the press, that should provide us at least some sort of comfort that the people's view of the freedom of the internet should at least be counted. You know, and maybe we can have a more educated debate or a more legalistic debate, maybe a better word to describe it, involving constitutional law scholars and maybe copyright professors, et cetera, or whatever, thinking about, well, what would these individual rights look, at, look like for freedom of the internet? Um, but I, I do like the effort uh, that ISA and Wyden have proposed on their website to have just people just like put in comments. And other countries are doing the same thing. People in other countries are doing the same thing, having this involvement. So that's where I would just dispute in terms of, uh, I think a lot, of millions of people understand the internet in a way based on their use. Hmm. You know, based on being so accustomed to it and enjoying this notion of openness. So you don't think it's indifference, it's more of misinformation? Well, I think it's more, in terms of like the copyright debate, yes, is more indifference but when the copyright debate sort of intersected with the internet freedom, well, that's when you know, everything exploded. And you know, we might see that again at some point. Uh, and that's why I think the, the technology is driving, in part, 
people's view of speech, people's view of free speech. Okay, any other questions? Right. Okay, yes, one question. So you said that calling the, the politicians was uh, one of the most effective means for, for uh, changing their minds on a bill. Um, this is kind of tangential to SOPA or the specific discussion, but what sort of things do you think technology can do, whether it be Facebook or Twitter uh, or, 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 or whatever else, to uh, change the scope of uh, citizens interacting with their elected officials? Okay, well, one thing, I mean, this goes back to the, the thumb, because uh, maybe with the, when the population in the Congress changes and we have uh, people who use the internet more, maybe uh, will have a different response to emails or online petitions. But one clever thing that uh, Tumblr did in terms of the protests on American Censorship Day was actually setting up a system on their website where you can call through the internet your member of Congress. So they had uh, set up an easy way to sort of find your member of Congress contact information and actually <coughs> call directly through the internet. So they generated, I think, over 80,000 phone calls that day. So that's one way in which technology sort of facilitated the powerful use of you know, phone calls to members of Congress. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, I think we might need more um, a change in the generation of our members of Congress to have greater impact with other forms of internet use. I do like President Obama's We the People system, where you know he actually has to respond to a petition that has, it's, I think now, 100,000 signatures. I mean, he has to, but he doesn't have to. There's been like, right. he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to concede, exactly. Drug policy he doesn't better. have to concede on anything, right, that's yeah. true. But it's better than nothing, right, to start. Well, is there a way that we can use technology to hold our elected officials Yes, I mean, there are certainly sites that are trying to do that right now. Open Congress is one where you can track your member of Congress position on various bills and, and uh, try to um, contact them. Uh, and I think all the bills are tracked in terms of who's supporting what, who's opposing it. And they use that actually during the SOPA debate. Uh, and then the other thing I would just say is that, uh, I mean, especially if you're a technologist and, or thinking about different ideas, uh, I really have confidence in the ingenuity of people, especially after studying all these protests. I mean, people were just thinking of incredible things to do uh, and organizing, for instance, the boycott of GoDaddy uh, on Reddit. So GoDaddy supported SOPA, and then someone on Reddit said, well, we should just uh, boycott GoDaddy because they support SOPA. And then within a week or so, 70,000 domain names were transferred from GoDaddy. And GoDaddy changed its position from initially saying, we have not seen any change in our business to, we will not support SOPA until and when the internet community supports SOPA. So they completely you know, did an about face, just as you know, all the members of, some of the members of Congress did, completely about face. So I guess I don't have the answer to what are the future platforms or means of communication that will uh, improve uh, our dialogue in politics, but uh, you know, I think there are so many smart people out there who are in the internet space who can come up with uh, hopefully new platforms and new ways to open the discussion. So I encourage I mean, any of you in the room who are thinking about maybe expanding out uh, with uh, the internet or nonprofits. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank please you. do take a t-shirt on your way out, and uh, please email me if you have any further comments about uh, the, the book. Thank you. Thank you.